Well, good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Anyone would think you'd rather be in Tesco's with everyone else. We're here to worship the Lord, and uh, it's a great time of the year. We're able to uh, celebrate the coming into the world of Jesus Christ, the greatest event, or one of the greatest events of history. And uh, I hope you're in good voice this morning. We've got some good songs to sing. Musicians, if you want to come up and uh, lead us, we're going to start with the very first song, the first Noel, uh, was to certain poor shepherds. Good news for all people in all situations. So let's link our hearts together. Let's stand. Let's sing the first Noel together. Shall we stand? The first Noel the angels did say Was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep Noel, Noel Noel, Noel Born is the King of Israel Then wise men fall Please be seated. Good. I haven't sang many carols this year. Normally I would be uh, going into some of the care homes or going into schools and doing assemblies or services there. But uh, with all the COVID restrictions, everything seems to have been cancelled. So it's good we can come today and we can celebrate this morning. And then at our Candles by Carolite service this afternoon. If you're available at four o'clock, it would be great to see you. What are you laughing at? What did I say? Oh, well. <laughs> Some people are dyslexic when they read. I'm dyslexic when I speak. I think I'm forever jumbling my words. But whatever we've got this afternoon, you are more than welcome at four o'clock. Let's link our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we look back to historical facts that a child was born 2,000 years ago in Israel. A baby that changed world history, split time in two. Uh, we date our calendars in the West, BC and AD. We remember that today, all around the world, there will be people in countries uh, far and wide singing the praise and uh, amazed at, again, the good news of this child. 
No one quite like him. More than just a Jewish baby in history. The eternal son of God who stepped into time. Lord, help us to grasp hold of what that means. Help us to worship him appropriately. And we pray this morning, Lord, give us uh, an insight for how this applies to our lives today. We thank you that Jesus is not uh, just historical, but he's current affairs. He's relevant for each and every one of us to change us and to help us day by day. So, Lord, we pray, accept our worship and uh, speak into our lives. For absent friends, you know, those who are having to isolate because of illness or um, vulnerability. We pray for our loved ones who aren't here today. You know, those who have loved ones in homes and are unable to, again, mix with us for fear of contamination. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with them in their homes and as they visit their loved ones today or over the next few days. We know, Lord, that Christmas can be a lonely time for many people. And again, we pray for those of this fellowship who will be on their own this Christmas or have limited contact. We pray, Lord, that uh, they might indeed find help and comfort in you and fellowship with your people. So thank you that we're able to reach out to one another and to support one another. And pray, Lord, we might be aware of each of us' needs over the next uh, period of time. We pray for today, Lord. Bless today as we commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, grace and truth. We thought we'd do a mini-series. We've been going through the book of Acts, and uh, we decided to have a break two weeks ago, and we looked at grace last week, and we're going to look at truth this week in the Christmas story. And there's a verse in John's Gospel that says of Jesus, he was full of grace and truth. So we thought we'd just pull out those two threads on our two Sundays together. And we're going to read together from the Bible, and uh, as has been our tradition during lockdown, I'm going to encourage folks to stand for the reading, if you don't mind. So let's get on our feet. Stays Martin falling asleep, bless him. Can we stand? And then we'll read a verse alternatively. So I'll read verse 1, if you can collectively read verse 2, and we'll just go through this portion of the New Testament, uh, John's Gospel, together. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to look at that little phrase, full of grace and truth this morning. And John, in his first chapter, repeats it twice, just so that we don't miss it. Great uh, uh, 
doctrines concerning the person of Jesus. Now, this is our all-age service. Every Sunday morning, uh, we have an all-age service, and we like to do something for the children, and in a bit, they'll go off to explore us upstairs. But I thought we'd uh, major in on the cracker this morning, because um, we are a bit crackers here at Duncan Road, and uh, crackers were a Victorian invention. And uh, I thought they'd give us a little insight as to what, well, some of the things uh, to do with Christmas. But I need a volunteer. Come on in. Holly, up you come. You thought I was going to call you Nicole then, didn't you? Because every Friday she comes in the door and I say, hi, Nicole. And she says, that's my mum. <laughs> now, you're ready to pull it. Don't fall over backwards after three. One, two, three. Whoa, thank you. Oh, look. I'm keeping that. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, let me have it. You go sit down, and who knows, maybe there'll be a little treat for you and the others later. Now, with a cracker, you get four things. First of all, you get a bang. A bang. It lets you know something important is happening. Now, here's a little trivia question for you. What happens on Ascension Day? What happens on the Queen's birthday? What happens on Coronation Day? What happened on the Duke of Edinburgh's birthday, though he's no longer with us? What happens on the Queen's official birthday? What happens on the birthday of the Prince of Wales? What happens on the state opening of Parliament? What happens on the, to get this right, prorogation of Parliament? And what happens at any royal birth, such as George or Charlotte, etc., or when a head of state arrives? Do you know what happens? There is a bang! Maybe it's in the Tower of London. Maybe it's at Edinburgh Castle. Maybe it's in one of the royal parks. And it is not a cracker. Normally, it is a very heavy gun. Four 25-pounder guns fire off a celebration warning, a welcoming warning, a bang, because someone important is here. So you always start with a bang. And uh, Christmas crackers remind us, Hey, they start with a bang. We are here to celebrate this Christmas. The arrival of the greatest head of state. The most important royal person who ever walked planet Earth. Jesus himself. So when you get a cracker, you get a bang. When you get a cracker, oh, I've got the toy. I've got the cracker. Penny, there's two things missing. I haven't got a joke. How can you, oh, why? How can you have a, oh, we might have. Ha, ha, ha. You were worried then, weren't you? This is coming just to hear this little gem. I know, are you ready? What goes up and never comes down? Come on, Colin. What goes up and never comes down? Abby knows. Go on, Abby. Your age. Your age. Not very Christmassy. Here's some Christmas jokes. What goes O, O, O? Oh, Santa walking backwards. Do you get it? Ho, ho, ho. O, o, o. Oh, here's another one. What do you get if you cross Santa with a duck? Santa with a duck. You get a Christmas quacker. A Christmas quacker. Okay, we'll stop the jokes. But jokes are to remind us Christmas is supposed to be fun. You're allowed to enjoy yourself. And you, mess it, you remember the message of Christmas. I bring tidings of great joy, not corny jokes. Great joy. So you're allowed to smile this morning. You're allowed to actually enjoy yourself. Something else about a cracker. Oh, oh, oh. Nicole, come up here. I love you. Oh, you can't. You've got a hat on. Holly, can I put this over your hat and your beautiful headband? Start turning around. Not just a hat, a crown. A crown. Now, if you can sit down. I phoned up Buckingham Palace yesterday and I got the Queen to record me a little message for you lot, especially today. So I says, Liz, put down the tea. Stop eating the digestives. We need some help. And this is what Liz had to say about crowns. <laughs> Hold it, let's go back. Why we, I'm not sure why we got music there, Josh. But uh, we should just be on the video clip. Do you want to click it at your end? And we'll see how we go. 
Oh, it's the trouble with royals. You can never get them to perform when you want them to. No, right, if you go to the kids slide, Josh, I'll move it forward if you want. <laughs> She's not going to work, is it? Right. Okay, Josh, have a look at me, Josh. Can we go to the kids slide, not the introductory slides? And we'll just go to that kids slide and there should be no... S should be perfect quiet. This time, will she perform or let me down? No. Okay, we'll move on. We'll move on. Something's not. I, do you know a special message from Elizabeth? And she was talking about the importance of crowns. And she has two crowns. And she said one of them is so heavy because diamonds are heavy. We forget they are rocks. And she says, whenever you read a speech, this is what you do. You ready? You lift the speech to your eyes. You never tip your head because the crown is so heavy. And this is her own word. She says it can snap your neck. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Or whether that's Liz just giving us the old, uh, you know, long tails. But she says, you never bend down because the crown is so heavy. Not only can it fall off, but it could snap your neck. So you always lift the speech to your eyes. So next time you're wearing a crown, a bit of information for you. So we've got the big bang to celebrate something important. We've got the corny joke to remember... Hey, it's a time of joy and celebration. We've got the crown to remind ourselves of a king who was born. And then the fourth thing you get with a cracker is a toy. And uh, we've got here a pack of cards, which isn't a bad toy for a cracker, is it? I think they're quite good. And uh, we had some toys on Friday night. In fact, we got some left over. I reckon we probably got one for every child. Do you know where they went? Can you go and get them? And uh, I can see Harry's keen on one straight away. Straight away. So don't worry, Harry, your toy is coming. Now, why do we give gifts away? Because at that very first Christmas, three gifts were given to Jesus. Frankincense, myrrh, and gold. Gold because he was a king. Myrrh, well, that was used in the temple, the place of worship, because he was a priest. And myrrh... That was rubbed on dead bodies. Why give a baby full of life a present for someone who's dead? Because the Bible says he was the Messiah. He was the one born to die. Three gifts perfectly suited. And uh, children, those who are 12 and under, we've got in this bag some toys that you can have. One each, okay? They are wind up. You could have a nice cute penguin, all right? You can have... A Christmas tree, or you can have a snowman. So there's one for every one of the children. Penny, you can give those out at the end, or Kathy can. Kath, can you come and grab those? If you give them out now, they're not going to listen to anything else in the service. They're just going to play. So we'll give you one at the end. But we give gifts to remind ourselves the wise men gave gifts. And why did they give gifts? Because God himself gave to this world the gift of all gifts. Jesus Christ. That's why we celebrate Christmas. So next time you pull a cracker, think of the bang. Someone important. That's why we have an announcement with a bang. Think of the joke. Time to be funny, to rejoice, to be happy. Think of the crown. Someone important was born. And then lastly, think of the gift. Because Christmas is all about the gift of gifts. Right, let's have a, a song together. And we're going to sing three carols because it's Christmas. And sometimes this is the only chance we get to sing our carols. So we'll sing a couple of little melody together. And we'll start with a more modern one from the squalor of a borrowed stable. Shall we stand to sing? From the squalor of a borrowed stable By the Spirit and a virgin's faith To the anguish and the shame of scandal Came the saviour of the human race But the skies were filled with the praise of Him Shepherds listen as the angels tell Of the gift of God come down to man At the dawning of Emmanuel 
thinking of heaven now, the friend of sinners, humble servant in the Father's hands, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, filled with mercy for the broken man. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain, joys and sorrows and I know so well. Yet his righteous steps give me hope again, I will follow my Emmanuel. Through the kisses of a friend's betrayal, he was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for the world's transgressions. He was suffering to save and lost. He fights for bread. He fights for me. Loosing sinners from the chains of hell. And with a shout, our souls are free. Death defeated by man. Now he's standing in the place of God. On the highest throne, interceding for his own beloved, to his father calls to bring them home. And then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds, hope of heaven and the fear of hell. But the bride will run to her lover's arms, giving glory to Let's uh, stay standing and we'll sing Child of the Manger, Infant of Mary, Outcross the Strangers, Lord of All. Child in the manger, infant of Mary, outcast and stranger, Lord of all. Child who inherits all our transgressions, all our demerits on him fall. Once the most holy of salvation, gently and lowly live below. Now as our glorious mighty Redeemer, see him victorious over each foe. Prophets foretold him, infant of wonder, angels behold him. On his throne, worthy our Saviour of all our praises, happy forever are his own. Sing one more, Jesus, name above all names. We'll sing this short one twice, please. Jesus, name above all names. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Saviour, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Name 
name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed be Please be seated. Thank you, musicians. And this afternoon we'll have some more traditional ones like uh, Silent Night and uh, perhaps ones that uh, we always associate with Christmas. Now, youngsters, those who are of a certain age are going off to explore us with Hannah today. So if you want to go upstairs now, that would be great. Good, and if you pay the ransom, you can have your kids back at the end, okay? So. Good, let's pray for the little ones. Let's pray for ourselves as we look into God's Word, shall we? So let's link our hearts together in prayer. Lord, thank you for each and every youngster in the building, and thank you for their enthusiasm, and we pray as they spend time looking into your word, familiar truths, like we're looking at them this morning, pray that these things might become real to them, and they might discover the God of the Bible, who has made himself known to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So bless them, and help them, and what we pray for them, we pray for ourselves. Give us insight now into your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, every week we look into the Word of God, the, the Bible, and like I say, John chapter 1, verse 14, we're just picking a thread this morning, the truth in the Christmas story, the truth in the Christmas story. Now, truth is something that we all feel is important, isn't it? Uh, there's a story told of a four-year-old girl, little Sophie, and her mum was really, well, worried because Sophie kept telling lies. And no matter how hard the mom tried, the little girl would constantly tell lies. And so mother decided, look, this is embarrassing. How can we stop her? I know. I'll tell her the story of the boy who cried wolf. And you might know the story of the boy who cried wolf. He kept telling the villagers that there was a wolf coming. And of course, they all prepared for this animal to, to come into the village, and it never came. And then, of course, there was one day he cried out, the wolf is coming, and the wolf really came, but no one believed him. So mom told little Sophie this story, and she said, because he kept lying, no one believed him. Wasn't he silly? Little Sophie looked up and said, uh, I was once eaten by wolves. <laughs> Truth is important, isn't it? Truth is important. Alexander Boris Thethel Johnson, better known to us as the Prime Minister. Well, he's been in the news over the last few weeks about the truth. What happened in those parties? How many were there? And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Boris and friends. We scrutinize them. Why? Because they are examples to the nation. We expect the truth. But so often, all we get our lies and deception. Now, if the truth is important in politics, it has to be true when it comes to religion and the things of God. And this morning, we're going to look at the Christmas story and the truth of the Christmas story. See, if you stick to the biblical text, you have no problem. Archaeology, history, and uh, critical um, analysis of these, these truths will reveal if they're true or real. So historical criticism, archaeology, and time normally shows what is a lie and what is true. If we stick to the text, I believe the Christmas story is reliable. If you go to traditions and the carols we sing, all of a sudden it becomes cloudy. And a lot of people's imaginations come in and distort the true image. Now this morning, I'm not just out to spoil the romance of Christmas. But I just want to pull out what, what is true, what, what is important from what we celebrate each year. 
And I thought I'd do it via a little quiz because I don't want to be too heavy. It's Christmas. I want to keep you with me, okay? So we're going to ask a few questions and just answer them as we go through the Christmas story. So here's the first one. And we'll do it on a true or false basis, okay? So that lets everyone in. You know, when we have uh, teams of students like the GLOW team and uh, I take them into schools and I take them to do a children's club and they want to do a quiz, I say to them, oh, hold on, what sort of questions are you going to ask? Don't just ask general questions because we're there to use the opportunity. You've got 10 minutes with these kids you might never have again. So teach them through your quiz. So don't just ask them what the capital of China is. That's not going to affect their lives forever. But you can actually say Christians have a special book called the Bible. What does the Bible mean? And give them a choice of answers. And you're teaching them with the questions about the Bible. And then how many books are in the Bible? It's not just one. Is it 66, 33, or 22? You're teaching them through the quiz. So use it to teach. It's still fun, still enjoyable, but truth is being taught. It's not just throwaway questions. And so I'm going to teach you this morning through this kind of quiz. Here's the first question. And you don't have to shout out the answers. You can just sit there glugly thinking, oh, I know that one. Question number one, true or false? There are no records of Joseph speaking in the Christmas story. There are no records of Joseph speaking in the Christmas story. True or false? Well, the answer is true. True. Joseph is a key character in the Christmas story, chosen to be the stepfather to Jesus, the man who would raise him. But he never says a word. Now, all the married men here are making up their own jokes, aren't they? (laughs) I'm not going to say that because that would be sexist, and I'm not a sexist person. I'm with the ladies. But there are no records of Joseph speaking anywhere In the scripture, he's a man of action, not of words. The unsung hero of the Christian story. We often sing, don't we, in our carols about the virgin birth, about Mary, about the wise men, about the shepherds, about everyone else. When did you last sing about Joseph in a carol? He's the forgotten man of Christmas, isn't he? In so many ways. And what I like about Joseph is this. He was a man who did not care about his reputation. Most of us care very, very much about what other people think of us. Joseph was prepared to marry a pregnant woman outside of marriage, which in his culture and his time was scandalous. Look at them. Having a child out of wedlock. They couldn't wait. And it would have brought shame on the family in that culture at that time. But Joseph stuck with Mary at the cost of his own reputation. And when we read the Christmas story, although we see it in fairy fairy story kind of terms, quite glossy and nice, it wasn't. It was tough. And for Mary and Joseph, it was a very hard, tough period. And for their families, as they were misunderstood by their villagers, by their friends, even by their parents. So Joseph... He's a key person in the story. He doesn't actually say anything in the text. How about this one? The wise men were three kings from the Orient. True or false? The wise men were three kings from the Orient. And of course, you know, the answer to that one is false. False. First of all, the wise men were not kings. Secondly, we don't know how many wise men there were. This is what the Bible text says, Matthew 2, verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the reign of King Herod, Magi, Magi, not kings, Magi, wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem. In verse 11 we read, I'm coming to the house. So the wise men turn up, not at the stable with the shepherds, like your Christmas card says. They probably came maybe two years later. Because they don't see a baby, we're told they saw a child. And they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And the reason that our Christmas cards have three wise men is because they bought three gifts. 
But chances are there was far more. Certainly three men carrying valuable gifts would not have traveled on their own. Robbers and thieves would have had a field day. They would have come in a caravan, a convoy. They would have had other people with them. Now, over time, church tradition, 500 years after this event happened, tradition gave the three wise men names. Uh, Melchior, Caspar, and Balthasar. But that's tradition, not the biblical text. And sure, these eastern visitors brought gifts, Gold, frankincense, myrrh. And I mentioned earlier, symbolic. You bring a gift that you know the person really wants. It would be no point me buying my wife uh, a pair of football boots for, for Christmas. She's not going to wear them unless she wants to kick the kids. And I don't think that's politically correct these days. I wouldn't buy her a pair of football boots. I might buy her a set of um, art, artistic brushes and paints because she loves to paint. That is suited to her because I know what she's like. I know what she wants. She doesn't want football boots, but she will have chocolate. She will have, well, you can fill in the blanks. These gifts were tailor-made for the baby. Gold, because a king was here. Incense, or frankincense, because he was a priest who would connect people to God. And incense was used in the temple. And myrrh, because one day he would die upon a cross. So they weren't kings, they were magi. We get our word magician from the same word magi. But these weren't your kind of dynamo or David Blaine type magicians. They didn't have things up their sleeves and entertain people. Magician or magi in Bible times referred to people who were experts in philosophy, medicine and natural science. You see, 2,000 years ago you couldn't Google for an answer. But these men were trained to be living encyclopedias. If you want an example of a Magi, think of the story of Daniel. Many of us know the story of Daniel, who was in a den full of lions, and God closed the mouths of the lions, and Daniel came out victorious. But we're told that Daniel ended up in Babylon because the Babylonians invaded his country, and they took away young men as slaves. In fact, this is what the text says. They selected only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men. So people like me, we would have been goners. You'd have been all right, Colin, but I'd have, I'd have been taken. You'd have been left. So they selected strong, healthy, good-looking young men that were all well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. That's why Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you find those names hard to remember, just think of Meshach, Yoshach, and a bungalow. Okay? So they take them away because they've got brains and they've got health and they've got good looks, and they cram them full of knowledge. They become walking encyclopedias. And then when the king has to make a decision, he wants information, he calls in the Magi. And it's the ancient version of Googling. And he says, what's the answer to this? And collectively, they come up with an answer. And these were the Magi, or three of a collection, who came to the baby Jesus. How did they hear about Jesus if they're in the east and he's in Palestine, Israel? Well, where's Babylon? That's in the east. And when the Jewish people were taken off to the east, did they take with them the Jewish prophecies and scriptures? And that's how they heard about this baby. Who knows? Who knows? But we're told that these magi followed a star. Now, was it a literal star? Some say yes, some say no. You can uh, Google and you can see those who say, no, at the time of Jesus 2,000 years ago, this planet was in line with this planet and this is what they saw. That may, it may not be true. Others have said, no, the word uh, star just means an orb of light. And maybe this was a bit like the Shekinah glory, the pillar of light that God used in the Old Testament to lead his people. A pillar of fire by day and... uh, You know what I mean, yeah. A a pillar of cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. An orb of light. Is that what God used to guide? We're not told. So it may have been a literal star. 
It may have been an eclipse of the planets. It may have been the Shekinah glory, as the Old Testament calls it. God guiding them with a special light for that situation. But they arrive at the house. Here's the fourth question, true or false? The star... Oh, well, we'll move on from that one because I just mentioned it. Next one. Mary rode a donkey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. True or false? Mary rode a donkey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. False. Well, I say false. She may have done. We're not told. We're not told. But nowhere in the biblical narrative do we read about a donkey. Now, we all know the carol, little donkey, little donkey. But we assume that her being pregnant meant she would struggle to walk and therefore needed a donkey. In fact, the first mention of, of, of a donkey in the Christmas story comes 200 years later, after the event, in a document called the Proto-Evangelium of James, written in the second century. And this is what it says. And there was an order from the Emperor Augustus that all in Bethlehem of Judea should be enrolled. And Joseph said, I shall enroll my sons, but what shall I do with this maiden? How shall I enroll her as my wife? I am ashamed as my daughter then. But all the sons of Israel know that she is not my daughter. The day of the Lord shall itself bring it to pass as the Lord will. And he saddled the ass and set her upon it, and his son led it, and Joseph followed. But that document came 200 years down the line. And that's the first mention of a donkey in the Christmas story. Most experts say, look, Mary and Joseph did not walk on their own from, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. For the same reason, the wise men did not travel on their own because they would have been attacked by bandits or thieves and robbers. They went in a caravan of people, not the motor home, but a whole group of them would have went and someone would have had a cart and a donkey, and if there's a heavily pregnant woman, she would have caught a lift on the cart or on the back of a donkey. So, did she actually ride a donkey? Not according to the text, but according, perhaps, to tradition. How about this one then? True or false? Both Joseph and Mary were told what to name the baby. Both Joseph and Mary were told what to name the baby. Well, the answer is true. In Matthew 1, 21 and Luke 1, 31, we're told this. A message to Joseph and then a message to Mary. She will give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. Now, we celebrated this week a certain young lady's birthday, 21 years old. 21 years ago, our daughter was born. And we had that awkward situation, what do we call the baby? And it wasn't until she was actually born that my wife decided she would call her Catherine. Second time round, I said, look, you chose the first time. It's my turn. I'm naming the boy. And so 19 years ago, when Arlo was born... I gave him the name Arlo. We chose because there are kids. That's what you do. Not Mary and Joseph. Peer pressure, you know what peer pressure is, don't you? Um, or tradition, tradition, sorry. Tradition is peer pressure from dead people. And tradition at the time of Mary and Joseph, you name the child after one of your relatives. That's what tradition said. But again, they didn't do that. They were told, you call this child Jesus. Why? And then the angelic being explained. He will rescue. He will save his people from their sins. He came not as an example, not as a teacher, but as a saviour. One who would die. And his very name declares that. And that's why John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus for the first time as an adult, he said, stare, look, gaze, behold, there is the Lamb of God. Now, he didn't mean Jesus was white and fluffy. But he meant just like lambs are taken to the temple, and whether you like it or not, this is what happened. They slit their throats, and they were sacrificed for the sins of the people. 
John says, there is God's lamb. And people will take hold of him one day and they won't slit his throat. They'll nail him to a cross. And he too will be a sacrifice for the sins of the people. So the name Jesus perfectly fitted the baby. But there again, in tradition, the father names the son. And God the father named Jesus. How about this one? Last true or false? Oops, I've told you... Let's get it right. Right. Well, I messed the slide up, but it was this one. Ah, that's what we want. That's the question we're looking for. The Christmas story is only found in... uh, Sorry, the Christmas story is found in all the four Gospels. Is that true or false? We have four special books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, called Gospels. They give us the biography, the life of Jesus. It's the narrative of... Christmas in all four of them or not? Well, it's false. Only two of the four Gospels give us the narrative that we celebrate this time of year. You see, the events of Christmas were important, but they're not the most important. The the, the emphasis in the New Testament is on Easter, not Christmas. It is on the death of Jesus, not the birth of Jesus. Now, you can't have one without the other. But the New Testament and the Gospels want you to realize it is the death of Jesus and his resurrection that is life-changing for you and me. So the birth happened, but it was to pave the way for those events at Easter. Now we have four Gospels, and each one has a different emphasis. We forget sometimes that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not just written generally to the whole world, though they apply to the whole world. They were written with a certain set of people, a certain audience in mind. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, he wrote primarily to Jewish people. Jewish people. Now, his Gospel is relevant for all, but all the way through it is a Jewish flavor. He starts off with a genealogy, showing Jesus to be all the way from Abraham, the father of the Jewish race. His first description of Jesus. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Not the King of humanity, though that's true, but he wants to speak into the Jewish world. And so the Gospel of Matthew is aimed at the Jewish people primarily. Mark, when he wrote his Gospel, he has a different emphasis. Mark writes to the Roman world. Remember, Rome ruled the world at the time of Jesus. They were the empire that everyone feared and was uh, uh, under their submission to. Now, the Roman mind was very, it's all about action. They don't want to know about genealogies. Who, and, and, and when Mark writes his gospel, Jesus is presented as the servant of God. And who cares where a servant came from? No one wants to know the history of a servant. All you want to know is, do they do what they're supposed to do? And so Mark's gospel is a gospel of action. And all the way through it is the word immediately, immediately, because this servant is the perfect servant. And when he does something, he does it fast. And the key verse in Mark's gospel is this, that the Son of Man came not to serve, sorry, not to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's why Mark doesn't mention the, the, the narrative, the Christmas story, because who cares where a servant comes from? Luke, however, is different again. He writes to, to the Gentile, the non-Jewish world. So he starts off a genealogy, but he goes all the way back to Adam, the first human, because here is the perfect human, Jesus. And his message is, this is the perfect man, emulate him, copy him. And the key verse in Luke's gospel is this, the son of man, he's one of us, came to seek and to save the lost. And then we read from John's gospel, no Christmas narrative, John just says the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. But before that he says, hey, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. This is God, God has no beginning. So I'm not going to give you a genealogy for Jesus because he has none. He's always existed as the eternal Son of God, but he chose to enter our world. And then John gives us this beautiful description of him. He is full of grace and 
truth, grace and truth. And twice in verse 14 and verse 17, those two themes are linked together. Grace and truth. Grace is what the Bible uses to describe how a person gets right with God. The Bible says, look, we are separated by God by a wrong attitude and by wrong actions. The Bible calls that sin. And most of us grow up saying, forget God, I'm going to live life my way. It's my life, I'll do what I want. And we bring God in like like the AA. Whenever we break down, quick, God help me. And then when we're up and running again, we push him to one side. It's called a wrong attitude. And because of that, it leads to wrong actions. And how do we get right with God? If our sins have separated us from God, how do we get right? We can't earn our way, the Bible says. And you can't buy your way. So God has reached down to us. And it is a gift. It's called grace. Something we get that we don't deserve. And 98 times in John's Gospel, we have that word, believe. Believe. If we believe. Not if we behave. If we believe we can discover God's grace in our lives. Truth. See, salvation involves grace. It's a gift. You can't earn it. But it also involves truth, what we believe. And Jesus said, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, so follow me. I am the truth, believe in me and I am the life experience me because no one comes to the Father except through me so we need both grace and truth salvation is a gift to those who believe not those who behave but there's a problem they contrast each other truth without grace is hard you see the law came through Moses the Bible says we know the Ten Commandments the first five books of the Old Testament, the law. But it always condemns. It's like looking in a mirror. It shows you what you're really like. And truth condemns. It says, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. All are separated from God by their sin and all will spend eternity in hell away from God. That's what the Bible says. That's hard. Who wants to be condemned? The Bible says the world's already condemned. But grace says you don't have to stay like that. You don't have to be separate from God. You can know God. You don't have to live with guilt. You can find forgiveness. You don't have to carry on with the old life. You can have a new life in Jesus. So whereas grace, or sorry, truth can be hard and condemns, grace is the very opposite. Grace brings forgiveness and reconciliation. And if you want to see an illustration of those two truths, have a look at this just as we draw to an end. Right, we're going to have one of those days, aren't we? There's a lovely story in John 8 that I was going to show you about a woman who was brought before Jesus. And she's brought before Jesus because she is caught in the very act of adultery. It is a setup. Because they don't bring the man, they just bring the woman. And the people who bring her are the religious leaders out to trap Jesus. So they set her up. They let the man go, they grab this woman, and in her shame and embarrassment, they throw her down at the feet of Jesus. And they say, Master, in the law of Moses, it says this woman should be stoned. Because the law condemns. It points out our faults. What do you say? And if Jesus says, oh, let her off, they'll say, you don't keep the law of Moses. And if Jesus says, stone her, they'll say, where's your compassion? thought you were different. So it's a, it's a catch-22 situation. Whatever Jesus says, he's, he's on a loser. And the story says, before Jesus speaks, he stands up, bends down, and he just writes in the sand. Now what he writes, we do not know. But how symbolic is that? The law. Do you know what? The Bible says God wrote the law with his own finger, the Ten Commandments. And here's the lawgiver writing in the sand. Do you ever wonder what he wrote? I kind of think maybe he wrote pride, greed, liar, all the things that these people were guilty of. Maybe he did, we're not told. And when they saw what he wrote, and then Jesus said, "Uh, if any of you are without sin, you just throw the first stone, go on. 
And the Bible says from the oldest first, they, they, they kind of went away. Because they were just as guilty. And then Jesus said, uh, where are your accusers? All gone. You see, to be condemned under the law, there had to be two witnesses. And with everyone else gone, there's only Jesus there, one witness. So he says, neither do I condemn you. I can't. We need two of us. And there's only one. So you're three to go. But when you go, sin no more. That's grace. It's forgiveness, but it's matched with truth. Don't carry on the way you did. Change. Change. And God offers each one of us grace and truth this Christmas time. He offers to forgive the past, to wipe the slate clean, to erase the things we've done wrong so that we don't have to feel guilty anymore. We can feel clean. He promises the gift of the Holy Spirit to help change us. And he promises us a hope in heaven. So Christmas is full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, we covered a kind of a lot of ground, some of it very familiar, some of it might be new, but help us just to process what we've heard this morning. And Lord, keep us from just being knowers of the truth. Help us to be those who apply it to our lives, we pray. Help us not to make grace cheap. Help us, Lord, to understand the truth and enjoy the benefits of being those who are saved by grace and walking in grace. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Let's sing one last carol, and a lovely old one, one of my favorite carols, this one, Thou who was rich beyond all splendor. The word was with God in heaven. He was rich. He had everything he wanted, but he chose to enter a world and live in poverty, born in a stable. Thou who is rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, becamest poor. Shall we stand to sing? Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, became as poor. Thrones for a manger did surrender, sapphire paved course for stable floor. Thou who was rich beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, became as Thou who art God, beyond all praising, all for love's sake, became as man. Stooping so low, but sinners raising, hemwards by thine eternal plan. Thou who art God, beyond all Please be seated just before we conclude. Um, if you make this afternoon, our carol service is four o'clock. It'd be great to see you. I've got it on the memory stick. We will have the videos. <laughs> they will work. So don't turn anything off, Josh, till we've loaded it up. More importantly, there will be some refreshments at the end, some seasonal refreshments, so do stay. And this morning, we should have tea and coffee as well. So don't run away. Do stay for some refreshment. It's good just to have a chat and some fellowship together. I think we've got tea and coffee, haven't we? Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. Just check in, just check in. Good, let's pray and let's conclude our time together. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to glean again information from your word concerning the events of history. But thank you, Lord, that uh, again, uh, we can just uh, think it through, ponder it, and then see how it applies for us today. So make these things real, we ask. So we ask now that as we depart, May the blessings of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen. Thank you, musicians.